Formulation of the Plane Wave Expansion Method. We're going to do two things here. First, we'll derive a very basic three-dimensional eigenvalue problem. And I'll mention that this is not the most efficient formulation, but the most efficient formulation I think is beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. And it's in another later lecture called PWEM Extras, Plane Wave Expansion Method Extras. But I will set up the basic eigenvalue problem here. We'll then move on to two-dimensional plane wave expansion method, talk about what that is and derive the eigenvalue problem. Formulation of the basic three-dimensional eigenvalue problem. So the plane wave expansion method is a Fourier space technique. So we're going to start with the matrix form of Maxwell's equations that we derived in our previous lectures. So here we are in matrix form, Maxwell's equations in Fourier space. What we can do now is jump to a block matrix form. And so on the left, this, these three matrix equations can be written in a block matrix equation. And a block matrix equation is simply matrices of matrices. And we can do the similar thing on the right. And really what's in this square matrix here is a cross product. It's K cross U. And here's another K cross S in this case. And we have our tensors for the permittivity and tensors for the permeability. I'm not going to talk about it much here, but if you wanted to simulate anisotropic things, it really just would entail these not being zero uh, over here. But right now we're going with just isotropic materials. We can do this in a bit more compact factor, recognizing this really is doing a cross product. Let's just write it as K cross. And over here is our permittivity tensor and our permeability tensor. And this is our U vector and our S vector. And I'm mixing the words vector here. So we have vector in the math sense of having a column of a bunch of numbers. And then we have a spatial vector in the sense of having X, Y, and Z. So in my notation, I'm using bold letters to represent sort of the numerical or mathematical vector where it's just a column of a bunch of numbers and this arrow notation to represent the sort of spatial XYZ component type of vector. So we have both going on here. It is a XYZ vector of a bunch of column vectors. And these are our convolution tensors now. And so that's a much simpler form. And just to remind us what's in these, our S spatial XYZ vector is SX over SY over SZ. Uh, similar thing for you and our K cross matrix, permeability and permittivity tensors. We put it in this compact form for a few reasons. One, it makes deriving the eigenvalue problem cleaner. And also in the later lecture where we're, we're doing this more efficiently, using a notation like this makes that much, much easier. So let's derive the eigenvalue problem. And we'll do this in terms of the electric field by eliminating the magnetic field. So the first thing we'll do is take that first equation and solve it for the magnetic field U. Now that we have an expression for U, we can plug that in up here and we'll end up with a single expression just in terms of S. And this will become with some algebraic manipulation, our eigenvalue problem. So we simplify that. We can bring the one over JK to the outside, then bring the JK over to the right-hand side, and we end up with just minus K naught squared. So if we stare at this long enough, we will realize this actually is an eigenvalue problem. It's a generalized eigenvalue problem. Generalized meaning there's another square matrix over here. A standard eigenvalue problem would be AX lambda X. Lambda here is not wavelength, it's the eigenvalue. But we have a matrix over here, so we have a generalized eigenvalue problem. And so we have an A and a B, and you can imagine in a computer programming language, building your K matrices, building your convolution matrices, building A and B, and then in MATLAB calling eig. And out comes eigenvectors V and eigenvalues D. 
I'll mention again that this is called the three by three or the standard three-dimensional eigenvalue problem. Maybe I shouldn't call it standard. I'll call it the basic or the easy version. And it leads to three by three matrices. It's possible to reduce this down to two by two matrices, but it involves projecting onto other vector components and it, it gets involved. So it's beyond what we're talking about here. Uh, here really we're after the two dimensional plane wave expansion method. I'll also mention we derive this in terms of the electric fields. It tends to be what I'd like to do because I interact with my simulations more through the electric field than the magnetic field, but it's probably more common to derive this in terms of the magnetic field. And the big thing that that does is it swaps mu and epsilon. By moving the mu out here, most of the time the permeability is just air. So this is the identity matrix and we end up with a standard eigenvalue problem. Let's visualize the data. So when we're building this eigenvalue problem, we need inputs. And here's what our inputs look like. First of all, we have to describe our unit cell. So if our unit cell is dielectric, does not have any kind of magnetic response, our permeability is the identity matrix, with just ones going down the diagonal and zeros out here. But we probably have some kind of periodic structure in the dielectric, and we get some convolution matrix looking like this. So these are inputs. These are what is describing our unit cell or the lattice. We also have to provide a block wave vector. This is the direction the wave is going in. And in fact, it's a vector. So it's conveying two pieces of information at the same time. It's conveying what direction this block wave is going through the unit cell. And it's also conveying the wavelength because the magnitude of that block wave vector is two pi divided by the wavelength. So really, the plane wave expansion method is, is answering a question for us. We're asking a question. In this unit cell, what on earth goes this way with this period? And we send this into plane wave expansion method. It does its stuff and out comes the answer. So some intermediate things. We have this K cross matrix and here's what that would look like if we plotted it. We eventually build this big A matrix, and here's what that looks like. And that looks busy because it has both Ks and the epsilons all mixed in there. And then we solve the problem. Out comes our eigenvalue matrix. It's a diagonal matrix with our eigenvalues. And the way we formulated this, our eigenvalues are K naught squared. So it's really frequency squared, or we'll just call the eigenvalues frequency. Yes, we know we have to take the square root of it to get frequency and K naught is omega over C naught. So yes, we'd have to multiply again by, by a constant of the speed of light to get frequency, but let's just think of K naught as frequency. We also get an eigenvector matrix. And if we just plot it, it looks kind of crazy. But if we think of this in terms of the columns, so now we're looking at our eigenvector matrix in terms of these columns, we can take this column and we can reconstruct what the field looks like. So that's what this field looks like. And what frequency is this mode? Well, it's the first column. So it's at a frequency described by the first eigenvalue. The eigenvalues and eigenvectors come in pairs. And so these columns, if we reshape them and calculate the field, we see pictures of the modes. So the columns of the eigenvector matrix are the pictures of the modes and the eigenvalues are the frequencies of, of those modes. Now, I'll admit something. We actually rarely need to look at these fields. Most of the time we're doing this, we're only calculating the eigenvalues. And we can do that quicker than if we're also calculating eigenvectors. But this is all we need for band diagrams, isofrequency contours, and that sort of thing. But that's what our, our raw data looks like associated with the plane wave expansion method. Now, we have chosen to have our eigenvalue be frequency. That means frequency is not the input to this algorithm, it's the output. And that has a very serious consequence. What if you wanna calculate bands for a device where the material is very dispersive? In other words, the material properties change over frequency rather dramatically. Well, the conventional plane wave expansion method cannot handle that because we don't input frequency. That's the output. And we get, we get modes at a bunch of different frequencies. So in fact, you have to build your device with the material properties of a single frequency. And usually you would choose where you actually want to operate the device, which means the bands away from that frequency are probably not correct. Now this is fixable. 
And it's beyond the scope here, but we talk about that more in the, the plane wave expansion method extras lecture. But the hint is, if the reason for this is having k naught square being the eigenvalue, don't make it the eigenvalue. So make the frequency the input, and we have to rearrange our eigenvalue problem so that there's a different eigenvalue. Formulation of an efficient two-dimensional plane wave expansion method. We need to start by talking about what we mean by two dimensions. So for a two-dimensional plane wave expansion method, we really need two conditions. We need a lattice that is uniform in the vertical direction. That's one. The other thing is we need to restrict propagation to be in that XY plane or the plane that's not uniform. Uh, we certainly can physically go in the lab and have a wave with a Z component in its direction, but numerically we need the wave restricted to the XY plane in order to reduce this to truly a two-dimensional problem. Otherwise we handle it with a three-dimensional problem. Another way that we can reduce things to two dimensions is the effective index method. So let's say we have a photonic crystal slab like we're showing uh, towards the, the middle of the screen. So we have a layer that's some kind of grading. We maybe have a super straight, a substrate. That's a rather complicated three-dimensional problem. Very often we can accurately simulate that as a two-dimensional problem this way. If we look at the cross sections, we drop a vertical line through the, the red region and a vertical line through the blue region. If we think about it, those are the only two unique cross sections. And if we were to look at both of those, those are slab wave guides. We could simulate that as a slab wave guide, calculate the effective refractive index of the guided modes in each of those layers, and then we can take each of those two effective refractive indices and populate a two-dimensional grid that essentially might look something like a top view of our three-dimensional device. This is called the effective index method, and we can actually get very often a quite accurate simulation of a very complicated 3D device with a simple 2D simulation. So numerically, how do we reduce this to two dimensions? Well, if propagation is restricted to the XY plane and the device itself is uniform in that vertical direction, then we can set the Z component, that KZ matrix, we set all of those to zero. So in our set of six matrix equations in Fourier space, anywhere there's a KZ, we can cross them off. And we end up with a new set of equations that contain no KZ terms. Now, something magical happens with these. Let's pick up that on the next slide. Here I've written those same two groups of equations, but I color coded them. And if we stare at this long enough, what we'll see is that the equations in red do not contain any of the terms as the equations in blue. The equations in red only contain SX, SY, and UZ. Those don't appear in any of the blue equations. And the blue equations have UX, UY, and SZ. So in fact, what has happened is Maxwell's equations has separated into two independent sets of three equations. We can take the blue equations aside and let's call that the E mode. We're going to call that the E mode because eventually we will take these second two equations and substitute them into the first and have one equation just in terms of SZ. That's an electric field quantity. So we'll call that the E mode. Sometimes this is also called the TM mode and for very good reasons, but it becomes a little bit confusing or arbitrary of what is meant by the titles TE and TM. So I prefer to call them E mode and H mode so that there's no mistake. Well, we can group our other three equations and we'll call that an H mode for the same reason. We'll take these bottom two equations, substitute them into the first, and we have one equation just in terms of UZ, which is a magnetic field quantity. So here's a summary of what we just did. We went from our Maxwell's equations, crossed off the Zs, and we separated those into our two independent modes. And we will 
proceed with each of those. So the first thing we'll do, we'll start with the E mode. We will take these second two equations and solve them for UX and UY. So we solve that second equation for UX and the third equation for UY. Now we'll take this expression for UX and plug that in up here. We'll take this expression for UY and plug that into our first equation. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we can multiply it out and we can simplify it and we end up with our final eigenvalue problem just in terms of SZ. We'll repeat this whole thing for the H mode. We will solve its second equation for SX, its third equation for SY, and now we can take these expressions for SX and SY, we can plug them back into the first equation. Now we have an equation just in terms of UZ, we can multiply this out and simplify, and we end up with our eigenvalue problem in terms of UZ. So we have two modes. If we want to know everything about a two-dimensional photonic crystal, we are forced to have to solve both of these. We can't solve one and then determine what the solution is in the other one. This is two independent modes that we have to solve both if we care about both. What would happen if we had a homogeneous unit cell and we built this generalized eigenvalue problem? Well, it would turn out that the eigenvector matrix would be a diagonal matrix. So here's the identity matrix. And what would be running down the diagonal? One over the refractive index. Our eigenvalue matrix would be B backward divide A. Now, if we did this, analytically, we would end up with an answer that looked like this. Well, let's just say we went ahead and solved it numerically, even though we had a homogeneous unit cell, we might end up with an eigenvector matrix that looks something like this. And we might say that doesn't look the same. Well, it turns out if we rearrange the columns and reordered them, we could do that and arrive at this analytical form. So don't depend on the order of the modes when you solve this numerically. We always have to take that into account. So let's talk a little bit more about the eigenvectors that we get. So we have a two-dimensional problem. We calculate an eigenvector. Let's say this is the eigenvector. And we have used five by five spatial harmonics. So what I'm showing over here is the five by five spatial harmonics. And I have assigned each one of these elements in our column vector to each one of these plane waves. Each one of these, the V1, V2, V3, that is a complex amplitude that would multiply that plane wave. It's a complex amplitude, so it's affecting both the magnitude and the phase of each of those plane waves. So we do all this multiplying, we add them all up, and we would get our overall block wave. And this is really the trick that has to happen if you want to use the plane wave expansion method to visualize the fields. From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.